Welcome back to another episode of Gamma 20. We're looking through the book of Genesis, why the beginning matters. Today's study is focusing on man, study three, the image of God. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father Lord, we ask that you help us understand all of us created by you as your image. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, so we've done we focused in verses 1 and 2 on God and God the creator of the world and today 27 to 31, mankind itself, right? So, uh, let's recap. We've got purpose and design for the whole of creation. You've got the location, light, sky, water, and then the inhabitants, the sun of the, in the, in the, and moon in the sky, flying, swimming creatures, animal and man. Uh, then we've got the rest of the Sabbath day. Today we're going to focus on day 6 and day seven. So the apex of all of creation is man, the image of God, because at verse 31, at the end of the creation of uh, the man, God says this is not only good, it's very good. So it's uh, a good vindication of our special place in the whole of creation. All right, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens over the livestock and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, right? So what is this image of God? We're not told exactly what it is, but we can deduce from the, from the rest of the chapters and other parts of the Bible. But what it is, is three factors. One, the image of God is when we, uh, is basically designed to reflect who God is, to represent Him, and also to relate to him. Let me show you what I mean, reflecting. First of all, if you look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, there's another chapter where this concept of image and resembling uh, is actually mentioned in the same Hebrew word. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. So therefore, a son is someone who reflects and resembles the Father. And in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So in the same way, our sonship is reflected in our purpose of being like him, reflecting him, being holy and actually blameless. It's ethical behavior. We're asked in Ephesians chapter 4 to put off our old self. If you look at verse 24, and to put on a new self. And this new self is created after the likeness of God. Again, the word likeness, we're like God in true righteousness and holiness. So therefore, we are to be like God or reflect God in our ethical behavior. And why is this? Well, Isaiah 43 says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So there is a purpose at which we reflect who God is and what He is, and it is done for His glory. So therefore, we have a reflective function where we reflect something of God's nature and character to the rest of creation. So all our human capabilities, our understanding, our will, self-awareness, moral conscience, rationality, creativity, everything that makes us different from animals, humans, is used to enable us to resemble and reflect God. If you look at it, we're like the dark side of the moon, featureless and designed for only one thing, designed to reflect the sun. So therefore, God's nature, God's character, God's goodness, God's beauty, our power of holiness is all reflected in our lives. That is the purpose. We're all made to shine. The word in Hebrew about glory is kavod, weightiness, outward luminosity, fame. The fame isn't intrinsic. We are created like the dark side of the moon, not to have our own glory, but to actually reflect the glory of God. So therefore, innate in each human being is a need to be significant, to matter. And in a sense, we're all like the dark side of the moon. We're all glory deficient and hungry for glory. It's a constant struggle to get the glory. You either get the glory by reflecting who God is or getting glory from other things. 
right? So here you've got center of our lives is a need to be significant. And all this is reflected in our activity, our motivations, our goals, our values, our purpose and emotions. All affects us because we are designed to shine. And everybody feels like the dark side of the moon. No matter how accomplished they are, they feel this unless that glory is the reflect, they're reflecting the glory of God. Here's Meryl Streep, a very famous actress. She says, I say to myself, I don't know how to act. And why, I mean, if, if Meryl Streep doesn't know how to act, I don't know who can. And, and why does anyone want to look at me on screen anymore? Lots of actors feel that way. What gives you strength is also your weakness, your raging insecurity. Although she's a very accomplished actress, she still has raging insecurity because she does not ultimately reflect what she was designed to reflect, the glory of God. Taylor Swift, world famous singer. She says, when you're on top, the only person you can compare with is yourself. And she writes, there's so much pressure going in to getting a new music out. If I don't beat everything I've done prior, it will be deemed as a colossal failure. So there's a benchmark, and the benchmark is her own glory, and each time she's got to do better than her last self, her last song, she's only good as her last song. And that's a lot of pressure because ultimately, she's glory deficient. The only thing that will make her satisfied is if she glorifies God. So what do they want to be? What drives them? Now, the opposite of glory is humiliation. Scientists have showed humiliation is an intense emotional experience. You put uh, monitors and re receptors in the brain and showed that humiliation is a potent emotional experience, all right, which is more negative and demands more cortical activation than any other negative emotion which are similar, whether it's anger or shame. Nothing is more, doesn't, uh, affects our brain more than humiliation, which is the opposite of glory. It is a loss of glory. It's a nice story here of, uh, of this uh, young boy called, in Australia called Quaden Bales. And he was bullied in school. As you can see, uh, United States, the highest incidence of bullying is basically bullying at school and online. But Quaden Bales was bullied incessantly in school because he was born a dwarf. And on multiple occasions, he tried as this young boy tried to kill himself simply because he was deemed worthless and glory deficient. A video of him crying and shouting and wanting to be uh, to, 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 to end his own life came out on the YouTube and people responded. A local football team actually put their t-shirt on him, the footy, and then he walked out to the stadium with all the tall men who were all glorious football players, and he was part of the team. And that actually lifted his sense of self-esteem because he actually tagged on to their glory. Their glory was reflected on him. So he didn't quite feel so bad. He can reflect their glory. This is the Hugh Jackman. And he, Hugh Jackman wrote to Quaden Bales and said, you are stronger than you think. No matter what happens, I am your friend, which means the Wolverine is your friend. So here, glory is reflected from another person, right? So if you can't be Brad Pitt, you can buy his watch and have some of his glory, right? Uh, you can join American uh, Idol, you can win prizes, have medals for bravery, or do brave feats and put your head in the mouth of a crocodile or, or run with bulls. All these are an attempt that we can generate glory for ourselves because we are glory deficient. If you look in the business world, people who are glory deficient are always looking at other people with a transactional view. You use other people for your own glory, whether they're employees or partners. And this is terrible because Jesus said to the Pharisees, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from only God? And so the that they were so focused on getting their own glory from each other that they missed the glory that comes from God, which of which they were actually already designed to have. And that's what man does. We look inward, a whole bunch of idols, and they look to create these idols, and they worship the very idols they create to give themselves glory, and they become what we they worship. Because Psalm 115, 7 8 says they have hands, describing the idols. They do not feel feet but do not walk, they don't make sound in their throat, those who make them become like them and so do all who trust in them.
That is the fate of sinful mankind. Now, gender is also used to reflect God's glory. God created man in his own image. Image God, he created them. Male and female constitute God's image. And so we have a situation where we actually, this is God's glory, a male and female perfectly in harmony with all different psychology, different gifts and proclivities, working together as a unit. And this unit is used to reflect the love of God, Christ with the church. It's a perfect image of which we're striving towards and you need two different genders in it. But often because of sin, we have competition, we have disruption, uh, the, the abuse of women uh, to be subjugated because men are stronger, or we actually blur the difference between male and female. And we now declare that there's no gender or we can change gender. In Ohio court in 2018, the parents actually lost custody of their transgender teen. This is Nicola on this side. And they, the, the court actually awarded her custody to the grandparents who allowed her to undergo sex change operation. There are four stages, the social stage, then they give you drugs for, to block puberty, and then you get hormones, which is the hormones which are opposite to your gender. And then final step, you have gender reassignment surgery. And this is not uncommon. Further than that, you've got today, gender non-binary, which means a whole bunch of people in the world are now saying that we don't want to be identified as either male or female. We have no binary. The whole bunch of vocabulary has come out. The non-binary umbrella are gender queer, gender fluid, bi-gender, pan-gender, demi-boy, demi-girl. It goes on and on and on. One of the most famous uh, actresses uh, is Ellen Page. And what she has done is that she's actually transitioned from a woman into a Elliot Page. And she suddenly says, I'm fully who I am. Now, this, this idea creates a disconnect between how individuals think and feel and who they actually are. Right? So they don't consider their physical genetic makeup as part of who they are because they're driven by who they feel they are. All right? So we are integrated wholes. We're not simply our own bodies, minds, or emotions. We're embodied souls. We live in a world where we're broken, but we're beautiful. And we need to, and because of sin, we struggle for all this. So therefore, there's really no need to say to God, I don't believe any gender. I don't believe in the image of God. So this is an assault on our beliefs and our relationship with God. Now, the next thing is not only we reflect who God is, including gender, is we also represent Him. If you look back into ancient Near East societies, the rulers would set up images and statues of themselves in places where they exercise authority or power. And, and we do the same thing. As you go to every government office, you will see the portrait of the current prime minister there because it, and these portraits represent his authority. The statues and reliefs of these uh, kings uh, were actually a meeting place between the supernatural world and the current world. And in and, and Genesis 9, 6, it says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. You cannot murder another human being, not because it's not a nice thing to do, but it's because the other human being is made in God's image. It's like diplomatic immunity. You can't touch somebody who belongs to the diplomatic corps of another country because touching him is like touching the entire nation, right? Now, then there's dominion. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our image, our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, uh, birds, livestock, and everything else. What is dominion? All right, how do we exercise dominion? Well, in the next uh, line, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So how we, we exercise dominion is actually procreation going all over the world, dividing, having children. Now, look at uh, verse, uh, chapter, uh, Psalm 8, verses 3 to 4, which looks at the dignity of man. When I look at your heavens, the work of your stars, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for? This actually applies to human beings. What is man that you're actually thinking of him? What is the son of man that you care for him? Yet, you have made him a little lower than heavenly beings, and you crowned him with honor and glory. You have given him dominion over the whole 
the works of your hand, you put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, also beasts of the field. Psalm 8 actually copies Genesis, right? So we are actually given dominion over all of creation. Now, if you look at that particular psalm, and then you go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, and it says, it's been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him, you made him a little lower than angels. Doesn't this look familiar? Hebrews actually repeats Psalm 8, but he repeats it. Psalm 8, original context applies to man, but in, but in Hebrews, he applies this Psalm to Jesus, now putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made a little lower than angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that the, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So what he's saying is basically the purpose of mankind was to represent God and have dominion over the whole of creation, sin came into the picture, and we were not able to fulfill our purpose in the manner which we were designed. And Jesus comes in as the true image of God, the true Israel, and through Jesus, we will finally achieve our purpose to be the image of God through the perfect person, Jesus. So the first commission is to have dominion over the fish, to see the whole world by the first Adam, and the second Adam is the one that truly fulfills it by the gospel being shared and discipling the entire world. Last uh, uh, is basically the image of God as relationship. All right. Here you have um, Paul telling the Athenians that God created man, one man out of every nation, to live in the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek him and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. He's actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. So we're talking about man created not only to, to, to reflect God, to represent God, but to also relate to him, that they should seek him. And, and basically here we have got a, a, a singular and plural God, say singular, and let us make God in our image, in our likeness. All right, so we actually have right in the beginning in Genesis, the, the idea, the concept of the triune God. We've got the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all related in perfect love for one another. So therefore the primary ca characteristic of God is actually love. If you are a singular God, and you decided to create something else, then basically love is a secondary characteristic. A triune God means right from the beginning, love was there, and love is the character of who this God is. So therefore, out of this love, you actually have creation of mankind. And so therefore, we actually are, are made to relate. Love comes first. God's aim in creation is to give Himself, His very self, is found in giving. He seeks to share himself, express himself in all goodness. So, the climax. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. And he says, it was very good. All right? Now, philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre talks about meaning. He says, life is absurd, but you can produce your own meaning like loving others. Here is a man who does not believe in God, and what he's saying is that, well, I don't really believe in the image of God, I will just create my own meaning, and I decided, oh, loving people is the most important thing. But he's actually pretending there's meaning and fooling himself, right? Now, look at the apex of creation. Now we've got to come to the last bit, which is the climax of creation. And the heavens and earth were finished, all the hosts of them, and then on the seventh day, this chapter two, God finished his work, that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from his work that he had done in creation. So this seventh day is actually the rest, not because God is so tired, but the rest of achievement, not inactivity, for he nurtures what he creates, he continues to nurture. God delights in his creation and enjoys the benefit of a finished achievement, which means it's like renovating your house. You spend all this time renovating your house, at the end of it, it's all built up. You're sitting back there with your cup of coffee and enjoying the extension, enjoying your big screen TV, and that is the picture cast. All right, and you remember Genesis written to, from Moses to Israel, and they have a seven-day work week, and it's recast as that. If you look at Exodus 20, 
what we're trying to do is parallel man with God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you will labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, not do any work. Why is this done? Why? The reason is given in, in, in verse 11. For in six days God made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in there and rested on the seventh day. So therefore God blessed the Sabbath day and made this holy. The Sabbath is instituted to parallel man with God. The meaning of Sabbath is, this is uh, Abraham Joshua Herschel, which is a Jewish uh, theologian. He says, the meaning of Sabbath is to celebrate time rather than space. Celebrate the Creator, not the creation. And so therefore, when we actually celebrate Sabbath, right, what we're doing is that moving from celebrating things, possession and rules, we actually, the Sabbath help us refocus on God and the image of God, which is basically man, right? Jesus in the Gospels was caught healing people, breaking the Jewish Sabbath. He healed the man with the withered hand in Matthew 12. He healed the invalid of 38 years in John chapter 5. And he says it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath because the Sabbath was made for the benefit of man. So Sabbath is something that we, we, we move from possessions, we move to, to celebrating everything for the benefit of God and fellow man. Now, that's why God says, Jesus says to the disciples, come to be all ye who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Uh, take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So therefore, this concept of rest, after six days of hard work, you rest. Jesus says, in Him, you have this rest. And uh, here we actually have, and, and in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4 says, so therefore there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter the rest that so no one may fall by the same, diso same sort of disobedience. So Jesus provides the ultimate Sabbath rest. When he's talking about, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, he's actually talking about the Sabbath rest. The rest where man will rest and enjoy all of creation with God. Now, we look at this chart before. What we actually have is God giving us pictures that we understand in human reality, which gives us an idea of what the spiritual reality is. And here you actually have the Sabbath day given to us. One day out of seven, we actually rest from all our work, enjoy, play football, do whatever you need. And this is actually done so that it will point forward to the last day. The first day of the week will point to what the last day will look like. It's a present gift given to us of, and it will tell us of the blessing to come. It's, a, it's basically when we are resting on the Sabbath day, where we're communing with God, it's actually a training ground for all of eternity, where all of eternity we will be having an endless seventh day, Sabbath.